uh, crunch seminar. Uh, today we have, uh, uh, excuse me, my screen is stuck here. Right, excuse me for a moment. Yeah, today we have two talks. Our first speaker is Santan Audi from who is uh, currently a NASA postdoctoral fellow at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology. Santan completed his PhD in physics from Western University, Canada, and his research is about understanding star and planet formulation uh, formations using hydrodynamics and magnetic uh, magneto hydrodynamic simulations. He also uses various machine learning techniques to link theoretical astrophysics with observations. Welcome, Santa. You may want to start the presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you. And thank you once again, George, for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, talk about my research uh, in this uh, in this group. Uh, I think I'm properly audible, right? Like, and my screen yes. was perfect. Okay. So let's get started. So as uh, the title of the talk uh, shows like uh, we we are kind of doing our very exploratory work here i haven't worked with pins previously before this paper so this is a, a project that we undertook just to see how much we can do in solving like hydrodynamical systems with self gravity relevant for astrophysical simulations uh, so this is done in collaboration with uh, ramit de uh, neil turner and shantanu basu so uh, Neil and Shantanu are like experts in star formation uh, and astrophysical simulations. Uh, myself and Ramit, we have explored a bit with uh, machine learning in other projects, but not specifically related to physics informed neural network. So as I said, like <clears throat> I will try to give this talks from an astrophysics uh, point of view because my training is in uh, astrophysics and this is like a more of a learning experience. And we wrote this paper with the hope that the community picks up uh, uh, and then we get some interesting results in the coming year. So uh, with that, uh, let's get started. Um, let's see. Yeah, so uh, today's, uh, I would like to briefly outline like uh, what is the agenda of today's talk and what I'm trying to achieve here. So uh, uh, today, like I would like to highlight like some of the astrophysical problems that we are as a community interested in. And with that respect, I'd like to bring into account, like, why do we need large-scale numerical simulation, particularly when we are modeling star or planet formation? So throughout, throughout the talk, I will always refer to star formation or planet formation because that's kind of my expertise. But of course, like when we talk about broad astrophysics, there are many, many uh, scopes there. For example, cosmological simulations, like galaxy formation simulations. And of course, other astrochemistry and other parts which are there. But largely in this talk, I will focus on how we incorporate pins and how we think that pins could be an uh, effective tool in, in modeling astrophysical simulations in context to star and planet formation. And uh, what are the current limitations of various numerical methods uh, that we use? Uh, let me be clear that in computational astrophysics, we have made tremendous progress in the last like two, three decades. So it's not that we are uh, we, we are like struggling with something is that we want to do introduce a new formalism because there are various limitations with our current numerical models. And we wanted to explore if pins could be an effective framework that could solve some of the issues that we are currently facing. Uh, so as I said, theoretical astrophysics, particularly star formation, planet formation has evolved over the last two, three decades. And we have moved way beyond like uh, studying analytic, uh, so looking for analytic solutions for various problems, largely because of development of computational power. Like we have like, massive supercomputers where we can run numerical codes and uh, extensively perform experiments which were otherwise difficult in, in the initial years of uh, such studies. So uh, of course I'm like briefly going to focus that why how we are going probing beyond the analytic calculations and analytic regimes that we initially started with and how we have advanced to have like quite advanced and sophisticated numerical uh, codes that we currently developed. But then with, with such, even with such development, there is no shame in saying that we have limitations in uh, various numerical methods that we use, particularly because of the various scales of uh, uh, probe that we are, or the scales of the various uh, limitations that we have because of the scales we're interested in, and also the resolutions we're interested in, that sometimes could be a huge problem with existing numerical codes, as I will slowly highlight in throughout the talk. <clears throat> so given that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, given that we have so many, uh, there are limitations with our current numerical methods, 
uh, we as a team thought like, uh, okay, can we advance such astrophysical simulations using uh, physics informed neural network? So uh, let me be clear here. I am th This work doesn't introduce anything new related to pins. It might be repetitive as far as uh, pins is concerned, concerned, but the idea here is finding a way to apply pins to existing astrophysical problem and trying to see if we can solve uh, some of the issues that we have with uh, numerical techniques that we currently uh, have. This numerical methods we talk about, as I will show in the uh, in the following slides, are quite advanced. So it, it's interesting to see if we can adapt pins in that framework and and further advance uh, what we are what we currently doing. And with that, like once we establish like how we have included pins in studying some test problem in our case, and uh, we want I want to discuss with this group because I'm sure there are experts in this group. Uh, like what next? What can we do with pins? such that we can revolutionize modern decomputational astrophysics. Uh, so as we end the talk sometime uh, and next after all my presentation, I really want to open up a discussion, if not today, but uh, even offline, like what can be done, how pins can be used to do like modern uh, cosmodic computational physics problems and how we can really change the way we understand star and planet formation and even galaxy formation and other systems that we're interested in. So computational astrophysics, as I said, my expertise lies in uh, understanding the physics and st uh, star and planet formation. And uh, I, I could say boldly, like even after decades of research, uh, we are at a point we can say that we still don't understand how things work. We have a good understanding of the various physics that is involved, but it is still hard to find a global understanding or global model, which can give you a comprehensive picture of how a uh, system evolves in interstellar molecular cloud, how stars form, how planets form. That is uh, mostly because of the complexities of the various physics involved. For example, the forces, the dominant forces that affects uh, the dynamics of interstellar medium is gravity, magnetic field, and turbulence. And we are basically modeling this fluid system with forces like gravity, magnetic field, and turbulence. But then to get the complete picture, one needs to introduce like uh, advanced chemistry, radiation physics, feedback physics. So as you can see, this is just a subset of various uh, interesting physics and chemistry that we are interested in. And with all this uh, complexities and complicated physics involved, the system becomes such uh, sometimes like non-tractable using numerical methods, even though we have codes which can do it, but there are limitations. Uh, this is a very broad picture kind of problems that I'm talking about. Of course, I don't expect pins to solve everything, but this was a big motivation that led, led our group to start exploring pins and see if we can um, solve some of the initial problems with this big, keeping this big picture in mind where we want to have a global system with high resolution numerical simulations to actually understand how star and planet formation work. So with that um, background in mind, uh, we can like briefly start exploring, okay, how pins work. So what you're looking at is a state of the art, like numerical simulation uh, done by using a star forge simulation code. Uh, so this, as I will start the simulation or start this animation, what you are going to see is the complex interaction of uh, a video showing complex interaction of simulation of gas cloud, which is like very massive. When I say massive, it is like 20,000 times like more massive than the sun. So in this visualization, as, a, as we started, you will see a time lapse of, of like uh, how the gas evolves. The lighter regions indicate like denser gas, the color codes encodes the gas speed, uh, and the dots which will eventually form will show the newly forming star. So let's get started. So as you can see here, the rendering follows the collapse of a star forming giant molecular cloud in one of the star forge simulation. Due to the interaction of gravity and the cloud and the turbulence, the cloud quickly develops filamentary structures that you can see in the simulation. In the dense filaments, the gravity overpowers the pressure, the gas pressure, and the gas collapses to form stars as denoted by the white dots. The gas continues to fall in the star, but the interaction between the rotating star and the local magnetic field causes the portion of it to be launched away from the star at high velocity as the protostellar proto jets. These jets start the and disrupt the environment further and the flow of gas in the cloud, allowing the star to form. 
So as you can see here from this very small animation or of, of a simulation of our interstellar medium, the systems are highly complicated. We evolved the system for about like 4.3 million years before we freeze it. And what you're looking at is a 3D rendering to get a, get a dimensional perspective of how the system evolves and how it looks over time. So the, what is the take home from the simulation? The idea here is that we are dealing with extremely complex nonlinear system with a lot of physics and chemistry involved. So that's where, that is the ambition and that is what we are trying to achieve with current day numerical simulations. And of course we have existing codes which can do it. But uh, the idea here is that we, we, we have limitations which I'm going to briefly touch on in the next few slides. Anna, this, is, this is an amazing uh, simulation. So can you say a few details how this was done? Was it a, uh, an ad volume code, speckle code, uh, how, how, who did yes. it? That it's really fascinating. Yeah. So this simulation is not done by me. This is a group called uh, Star Forge. So they have used basically a MHD magnetohydrodynamic code with including radiation physics. And uh, I can, uh, yeah. Let me see. Like, uh, and do I have more details about it? I can get back to you with more details. Like, I just found this very fascinating with what they have done. But the idea here is this is hydrodynamics. And with uh, they also have magnetic fields in it, and of course self gravity in the cloud. Uh, self gravity is there, and they have basically what was interesting here. They have included radiation physics and the feedback from the stars, so that was really interesting. So yeah, so this is uh, publicly available, so anyone can use it if people are interested in. So this is the state of the art that I'm talking about, and uh, and so coming back to my current slide here. So this is another interesting simulation of planet formation. So the the plot you are looking at left, I will just start the video here. So planet formation is another interesting regime, but we are talking about different length scales once again here. So what you're looking at left is how planetesimals, which are like kind of seeds for current day uh, planet formation are formed because of interaction of dust and gas. So these are once again, like shearing box simulations of hydrodynamic simulations where dust and gas interact with each other and the dust slowly accumulate to form clumps, which are in principle, uh, uh, seeds for current day planet formations. So these are once again, hydrodynamic simulations run in extremely expensive simulation because of the resolutions that we're interested in. Uh, this is another area of interest of uh, planet formation simulations. And once again, on the right, what you're looking at is a planet rotating uh, in a dusty disk so around a central star. And as the planet rotates in such as dust, uh, disk of dust and gas, uh, you can see like opening up of gaps and various features that, that are coming up. So the idea here with this three simulation is to illustrate that yes, computational astrophysics has various interest, various domains of expertise and various people working on it. There are very advanced code like this uh, star force that I just uh, showed you. And then the other examples are also Athena++ code. This is Fargo 3D. So there are various codes which are available. So our motivation, which, which was like, what can we do next? There are limitations with this codes, of course. And so one of my motivation was to see if if we can use pins to like uh, like reduce some of the, or address some of the limitations with this existing codes. And uh, that's what like in that what helped us to start it, start with this study. So to briefly touch on what are the challenges with this current models, like some of the codes that I showed and. Um, what are we dealing with in day-to-day -day astrophysics? Like, what are we trying to address here? So the first major issue is resolution. So if you remember the first simulation that I showed of the interstellar molecular cutout, we are talking about length scale of 50 light years, like the box that I showed, it's like on 50 light years. Then as you have system collapsing due to self-gravity, like formation of those like cores, which could potentially form stars, we are interested in length scale of 10 to 100 AUs. So if I do the calculation, it's around length scale, uh, the, the length scale involved is around 10 to the power of six, like million times. So this is an extremely large variation in length scale, which if you're doing, if you're doing finite difference codes, like the one, the star for star forge is, is extremely difficult to, to run such codes, like to have a, like to do it in a reasonable time or even have computers, which could fit such resolution, like, uh, like address such resolution. So one of the major resolution with most astrophysical system is 
uh, probing having having a code which can deal with such like million times change in length scale resolution or density resolution. And the other uh, problem that we face is scale. For example, like sometime we can achieve such resolution if we simulate like tiny patch of a system and then reach, achieve the required resolution as you can as you saw in the streaming instability problem with planet formation. But the thing is that when we are modeling tiny patch of a system, we are often mis missing the essential physics. So the idea is to have global simulations where we capture the essential physics and get a comprehensive model of our system. But with global simulations and high resolution, varying like millions, 10 to the power of six times in length scale, it is very difficult to address this with a finite difference code. And the, another important problem is if we want to model these systems in 3D, they're extremely expensive and memory intensive. Because 3D system, like the one that I showed you, it's often impossible to have computers current existing computers which can model them with such resolution. So the idea here is we want to have high enough resolution capturing vast variation in variation in length scales and density and want to have global simulations and also do 3D simulations. So this is a big picture. This is what we want to have. Now, of course, like as a starting point, I didn't want to like start with pins and like start solving such complicated and complex simulation. The idea was to start somewhere and then see how the uh, community response to that and how people can pick up uh, pick up like pins and or, or different frameworks, for example, where we can address these issues in particular and see if, what we can do from there. So with this background in mind and the motivation in mind, we introduce, entered, we introduce GRIN, which is like gravity informed neural network for our case. Uh, let me be clear here, like the system we are solving here is a simplified version of what I have just shown, because the idea here is to solve, find a system, find an interesting problem for which we know the exact solution. And that I will show shortly here. And to see how well green performs or pins based model performs when compared to linear solutions or exact solutions that we have in certain cases, and also with like some standard finite difference code. So that's, that's the idea. Okay, so the system we are interested in is a self-gravitating hydrodynamic system. So basically we are modeling interstellar molecular cloud and we are interested to see how the system evolves under self-gravity and turbulence, uh, and of course, thermal pressure, thermal gas pressure. So that's the idea here. This is very similar to what we started with the first simulation, but of course, we don't have the complexities of radiation physics, chemistry, and or even the feedback. We don't have all those things. We are more interested in a very simplified structure because the key here is not to solve complicated problems, but to show that yes, beams based mechanism can actually address existing problems. So self-gravity is the key factor, which essentially drives the dynamics of the system we're interested in. In this case, it's like collapsing core, but it could be anything like formation of galaxies or instabilities even in protoplanetary or protoplanetary disk. So basically we have three equations that we focus on. One, the top is the continuity equation, the middle is the momentum equation, and the third is the partial equation. So rho is the density of the gas that we're interested in, V is the velocity, and phi is the gravitational potential here. So these are very three standard equations that we are going to solve. Of course, this equation can have variety of solution depending on the initial and the boundary condition. So we will, in the next slide, I will briefly introduce the initial condition we chose and what led to that choice. And of course, the solution, corresponding solution with pins and other uh, like finite difference and linear theory. <laughs> So before we make uh, any further further approach, we want to, I wanted to establish that the system that I just introduced can be solved under some linear approximation using some perturbative method. Why this is important? Because this is important because we wanted to get a good understanding of the physics involved in the system. It was not just solving some random differential equation. It's Can I just... ask a question because I, I, it wasn't clear how phi relates to the pressure and the, what is the constitutive equation? Uh, okay, so we have... Yeah, so I missed, there's a, a equation of state here, which we consider ideal gas here. Ah, so, okay, so you have equation of state, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then so, phi, but, but phi is not coupled. Phi is like a passive, you just got the density and you get phi. Phi is what? Phi represents what? The gravity. Phi represents the, uh, the gravity. Yeah, so phi is just divergence of G. So this is coupled, yeah. So G here, the small g is... Ah, okay, like so phi is divergence of... Okay, okay. Yes. Okay, that's it. Yeah, if it's it divergent, it's fine. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's how these three systems are coupled. Okay. 
So, uh, so as I said, like the first step is to establish some kind of understanding of lens scales involved in this problem, because we wanted to see, we understand the physics on the system involved and whether green, uh, our model green captures the physics. That's, that's the key part here, because as I said, the idea is just to establish that our system solves a physical, uh, sorry, our model solves a physical system and it's accurate. So if I take the continuity equation, the momentum equation and the uh, Poggio equation, it is possible that we can do some kind of linear perturbation theory, use linear perturbation theory, and uh, only along one dimension just to reduce, uh, just to make it more simple to understand. So when I say perturbation theory, I can just perturb my density with, with some density rho one, with some background, constant background density of rho naught, and similarly do it for velocity and g. And if I just substitute this perturbations into, and considering only one dimension here, so it's just del del, partial of x here, I've not considered other dimensions because of simplicity here. So it's possible to write the continuity equation, the momentum equation, and the Poggio equation in a simplified form as I just wrote it. What, what is the advantage of this? Because this is in this way, we can somehow decouple the equation and get some sort of understanding of uh, uh, length scale that is involved in the problem here. So once we do such kind of linear analysis, and then just calculating the Fourier component of both the density and the velocity, replacing this row one in the in the following equation and v1 in the in the equation in the left uh, what we achieve here is we can this leads to a characteristic length scale of instability is jeans length so those who are familiar with any kind of gravitational instability jeans uh, jeans instability is kind of classic so the idea here is we have a characteristic length scale lambda j which depends on the signal speed in this case the sound speed c square and the density of the of the uniform, the background density, uh, rho zero. The others are constant. So the idea here is we have a characteristic length scale of instability in the system, where, which we have linearized just now, such that if we have length scale of, if we perturb the system with length scale lambda, which is less than the Jin's length, we have propagating, we have a stable system, and we see we find propagating wave in case of like sinusoidal perturbation. And then if we have lambda greater than the genes length scale, it sets an instability leading to exponential growth in density and velocity. So that's the idea. Uh, we wanted to establish that. So we have a length scale in the system. Depending upon the length scale of the initial perturbation, we can get either a propagating wave with some sinusoidal oscillation maybe, and or we can get some uh, exponential growth depending on uh, the initial perturb length scale of lambda. So and we for for uh, for a good what do I say? Like for good demonstration, we chose some uh, sinusoidal initial perturbation condition because those are like good visually. But of course, this is just uh, for uh, uh, for uh, convenience here. One can choose any any sort of perturbation. It could be uh, random noise. It could be some Gaussian with some power power law field in it. So, so that that's the. Yeah, that's not important. What we chose here is just a sinusoidal initial perturbation in density and velocity with a preferred length scale. And we wanted to see how the instability grows in case of like lambda greater than lambda j or how the wave propagate in case of lambda less than lambda j. So now we have established a linear theory for the system and we wanted to solve this using uh, pins uh, and see how it works. Just to keep in mind that the we also have the instability growth time scale, which is like tau one over alpha. Alpha depends on density. Just to keep in mind, we we will refer to it later. But at the moment, just these are uh, expression that you can one can keep in mind. So uh, analytic and numeric uh, numerical approach. So linear perturbation theory, while it gives you a good understanding of the system, but what happens is, as you saw in the simulations, system astrophysical systems are highly nonlinear. So of course, the linear approximation or linear perturbation theory breaks down in the nonlinear limit. So while these are good approximation to get an idea of the physical system, but to uh, get a good or dynamics of the evolving system, it's hard, hard to understand or hard to continue with the linear theory. So we uh, we need to have some kind of numerical approach to solve such systems. So finite difference is something that traditionally people use. But as I mentioned in my previous few slides, that there is always an issue with resolution of the grid. If we are trying to uh, like resolve length scales of order of 10 to the power of 6, we always have like the grid size becomes tiny. That means the time step becomes even smaller if we want to maintain accuracy and has stability in the system, then it becomes really hard to integrate longer <clears throat> in time. 
And then, of course, and we are dealing with high nonlinearity and collapse, like there is a steep gradient in density. Then also, finite difference can struggle. Uh, at least basic finite difference code can struggle so uh, to doing long term integration so that's something that uh, we we have some challenges with numerical methods and of course like if we are scaling from 1d 2d to 3d increased dimensionality increases the memory requirement and of course the computational time although the the system we are interested in is relatively simple to handle but once we go into larger system uh, then it becomes a real issue so yeah the scaling from 2D to 3D is a huge jump, and, and that's a severe limitation with numerical approaches. Uh, and <clears throat> just going over the same thing, basically, so uh, so numerical resolution and resolving high density region is an issue with numerical methods. So that's why we thought we could use uh, <clears throat> maybe use pins to address this. And uh, of course, like when we most simulations that we're interested in, when we go for like 3D, 3D calculations, that, that's when we struggle with computational time. Okay, so then our question is like, with this background, we thought, okay. Uh, excuse me, can I ask a question? Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, this is Kamal from Brown. Uh, your stacks are the, uh, particularly in the, like, uh, what do you call, uh, planets are moving, but your Poisson equation is a static equation. So your gravity is changing or how it will take care of that? Okay, so the planet simulations that I showed is it doesn't have any self gravity in that. That was just uh, the planet orbiting. It's just a hydro simulation with uh, but the <clears throat> it doesn't have self gravity in it. It's just the central star influencing the planet. So we don't have the self gravity in the dust and the gas in the in the simulation. If you're referring to that, in our system, this is a gaseous system, <clears throat> and the Poisson equation is in uh, capturing the self gravity of the gas. There is no planet here. Okay, but uh, your particles are moving, so your gravitational is changing. Or, sorry, your particles are moving, so your uh, the gravitational field also is changing. Yeah, so the density is so this is a fluid, right? So the density yeah. is changing, and so the gravitation, the Poisson equation is also changing with time. So we are following, we are consistently solving Poisson equation in each time step. Okay. Okay. Now, yeah. So yeah. it's not a constant, like constant. It's every time it's changing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. If it, oh. if we, as we evolve in time, the we, we recalculate the gravitational potential at each time step, and then if we are doing in a finite difference way, we recalculate the Poisson equation at each time step, and then uh, update that in the momentum equation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so with this, we thought, like, can we use spins? Because as we know, the spins traditionally can, um, we, it leverage the universal approximation theorem to approximate solutions of PDE. So the idea here is that since continuity momentum equations that are technically conservation laws, like conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, whether pins can uh, leverage that and, uh, and, and stick to the physics and, and, and maintain the conserved quantity and solve our system. And then another important thing is that uh, like if we have like further constraints like divergence of magnetic field for a magnetic system, how and can we incorporate such uh, physics systems like like hard constraint in the loss function? So yeah, phys pins kind of gives you this flexibility of incorporating the physics in the system in a more uh, in a more natural way uh, because uh, with finite difference we sometimes like it could could not like could even like. The conserved quantities might not be maintained, but in physics, in principle, it could like lead to conservation and also other physics principle. It can stick to that. And then finally, one of the interesting motivation was we it's a kind of a mesh-free framework. So we were thinking like since finite difference has issues with uh, mesh, because when particularly when we are going from 1D to 2D to 3D, we see it's computationally becomes much challenging to handle things with finite difference. So one of the motivation to see if, okay, pins being meshless, can we uh, address the issue of resolution? Can we address the issue of dimensionality with pins and see whether it does uh, better than finite difference or at least comparable with finite difference in certain cases? And uh, as I said, we tested this for a simplified system that we that I just introduced. It's a 3D system with three equations and with some uh, initial condition that for which we have linear understanding, linear solution and, uh, and an actual solution just to compare. We had a better understanding how pins perform compared to both uh, linear, linear theory and finite difference solution. So before we go into the uh, details of it, I just briefly highlight, yes, like for the system that we were interested in, we found that pins did a reasonable job, if not a very good job. 
So the key results that I'm going to talk about in the succeeding slide is we found that pins uh, captures the gravitational instability, as you can see in the movie or the animation in the left, where the density is growing for a sinusoidal perturbation with length scale, with the initial length scale is greater than Jin's length. On the middle is a pressure wave of uh, of gas, which is which is once again a solution with pins. And we found what we found that for length scale less than Jean's length, we don't have instability, but we have a pressure wave which moves throughout the interstellar medium. This is once again a pin solution. The interesting part, and I am open to a question when we get to the end here, is that we found that the compute time when we compared for our system and our initial condition is that this was really interesting. What you're looking at is the wall clock time on the left and the number of dimensions on the right. What we found that finite difference as expected, the wall clock time goes up, like it increases like orders of magnitude when we move from 1D to 2D to 3D. But with pins, at least for the system that we that we thought that we are solving, is it's almost constant that the, that the computational time is almost same for one, two, and three. The slight increase that we see is because of increase in the in the velocity equation because velocity is 1D, 2D, and 3D. So increase in dimension means we are solving an extra equation. So we find that some increase in the uh, wall clock time. But what, this was a initial, very interesting result. And I will elaborate as I go further that we find like uh, pins grin model or pins based model is 10 times faster than finite difference in 3D, which from an astrophysical point of view is, is extremely interesting because in most cases we don't solve 3D problem for this exact reason that it's very expensive to do it with finite difference. But uh, looking at our initial results, we we found, we got excited. Yeah, if this is a real, if it's something real, then this has a lot of future in various applications in astrophysics. So briefly on the green architecture, as I said, this is a very vanilla network that we start with just with three cross two, like hidden layer, three cross 32, sorry, with hidden layers and with input is just the co-location point space time domain. The output is the density, velocity, and the gravitational the gravitational field phi. And of course, just traditional pins um, mechanism here, we compute the MSE, the loss function, the loss from the, from the PDs. Then we have boundary condition, MSEs from the boundary, and then we have MSEs from the initial condition and the total and the final loss is the sum of three. We we train the system to, <clears throat> to give a solution for both density, velocity, and uh, and the gravitational phi potential phi for all space and time. So that was a simple, the simplest we can think of because as I said, the idea was not to uh, introduce complexities, was to see that how pins can actually tackle a simple problem uh, that we are currently dealing with. And of course, like uh, just to complete the training process. So in order to train the physics informed neural network, we take the output from the pins and we just substitute in uh, in the in the continuity equation and calculate the residue. We do the same for the momentum equation, calculate the residue, and then we take the Poisson equation, calculate the residue. And uh, this gives uh, us the total uh, MSC for the PDU, which is the sum of all the residues from the three equations that we are getting. And to add to that, we have the boundary loss, where the boundary is a period, we consider periodic boundary condition in our cases. And we also calculate, so from there, we calculate the MSC for the periodic boundary condition for the density, velocity, and the uh, and the gravitational potential phi. And then finally, the initial condition. So initial, uh, whatever the initial condition we choose, in this case, sinusoidal perturbations, and we calculate the MSC from the initial condition. And then with, with calculating the total loss, we optimize our network and we train our green model. So uh, this is like a, the simplest thing, simplest way of training we, we did. We didn't involve any kind of network modification or, or capturing some complicated network or most advanced network. This is the most vanilla we could think of because as I said, the motivation is to see how a vanilla network approaches a solution, uh, give the solution to our system of interest. Okay, the case studies that we address here is, first is a propagating pressure wave for which as I said, if you remember, the length scale of interest is lambda j. That's the length scale of instability. For wavelength less than a lambda j, we have propagating pressure wave. For length scale of uh, perturbation of length scale greater than lambda j, we have gravitational instability. We do the same, but with nonlinear growth because of the amplitude of perturbation. And then finally, we talk briefly touch of some development of shock fronts in, in the system of interest. So propagating pressure wave. So this is a simple picture of initial condition where we start with a uniform background uh, density, rho naught, and then we put up the system with some sort of sinusoidal perturbation with amplitude of like 0 0.03. This amplitude is important because depending on how strong your amplitude is, the system can quickly become nonlinear. 
In this system, we take amplitude of like 30% of, sorry, 3% of our initial uh, background density. So it's in the linear regime. And if, since the wavelength of perturbation is less than the gene's length, we do not get an instability, but what we get is a propagating uh, pressure wave. So what you're looking at on the right is, uh, on the top is the density, contour plot of density for X as a function of time. And on the bottom, we have just taken, although these are 3D simulations, we have taken a cut along a particular X and Z just to give a better perspective. So on the right, you're looking at a density wave at different time snaps. So we are integrating it till T equals to eight in this case. And, uh, and on the bottom, we have velocity and we have plotted both the solution from the grin, which is denoted with uh, the cyan color. And then we have uh, linear LT stands for linear theory, which is the exact solution in this case, because this is in the linear regime. And then FD stands for uh, finite difference method. And, so, and on the decilin stands for mismatch between uh, the FD solution, linear theory compared to pins. So as you can see in the top, the density, the wave is propagating and then with time. And the solution of grin is consistent with both linear and finite difference. So is the velocity. The deviation that we see with finite difference in the final time step at t equals to seven is, we understand that's because of some numerical diffusion coming in in the finite difference routine, because we have used a very classic like Lax method. We haven't, once again, we haven't done any complicated uh, finite difference. This is classic Lax method. It has numerical diffusion, which we are aware of. And so that kind of shows in this, in this solution that we see that both in density and velocity, the, uh, in, the in the final time step t equals to seven, the finite difference solution, the amplitude goes down. And we understand this is partially because of like some kind of numerical diffusion, but overall the three solutions are consistent and the error is less than 1% in all the cases. And next case study is gravitational instability where lambda is greater than gene's length. So here we are interested in uh, the instability that grows. So as you can see, once again, we have very similar initial condition. The only difference is the, uh, the, the lambda, the wavelength of the initial condition is greater than the gene's length scale. So what we expect here is as shown in the movie in the left is the density grows with time, the instability grows with time. And on the right, once again, you're looking at on the top is a density contour and plotted X versus T. As you can see with increasing time, the density uh, contours are the given gets brighter. That means the density is increasing. The same thing is shown in the bottom two panels of density and velocity. As you can see with increasing time, the different time snap that you see, the density, uh, the amplitude of density grows. That's because of the instability growing. And we will show in the next slide that it is exponential growth as expected. And so is the velocity in the bottom. The velocity also keeps growing. The interesting fact here, what it captures here, the velocity and the density are out of phase by 90 degree. So that's an interesting physics because for the density to grow, the matter or gas needs to converts to that, like it should, it should move toward the region of higher density. And so the velocity, uh, the highest velocity kind of, uh, um, sorry, the zero velocity kind of coincides with the density peak because that's the region of maximum density. That means all the gas has kind of uh, accumulated there in the maximum density. So the velocity is zero there. So this once again captures the interesting physics that's happening, even though the system is simple, but the physics is quite interesting here. And we find that the three solution, GRIN, LT, and FD kind of consistent, with the same uh, noticeable feature that finite difference slightly uh, mismatches in the final time snap, partially because of some kind of numerical diffusion that's coming in due to the lax method application that we have done. And then uh, this is another uh, small simulations or animation that shows that which captures the uh, uh, the exponential growth of density. So on the on the top panel on the right, what we are looking at is the log of the density growth, the rho max function of t. So since it's log scale, it will be a linear growth. And you can see as we let the system evolve, the pin solution is growing exponentially. Uh, and on the left, uh, the density is also growing. And they're kind of matching with both linear solution and finite difference solution. This, the deviation that we start to see is, uh, we believe, is because of some numerical dissipation in finite difference. But the interesting fact is the green solution does capture the interesting uh, exponential growth in density in both velocity and in, uh, in and in the density of the gas, and the velocity is out of like out of phase with uh, with with uh, with density that is also like kind of captured in the in the solution here. And then finally, we we do study like once again non growth like in gravitational instability, but but this time in the nonlinear regime because as I mentioned previously, depending on the amplitude of your initial sinusoidal perturbation, 
This time we have like 30% the initial background density. So the system initially quickly becomes uh, nonlinear. And this is also captured in the solution here. So in this case, once again, you can see the density and the velocity solution as a function of time. Uh, what's interesting is we start losing the sinusoidal nature and more like a sharp peaked transition. Uh, we don't have a linear solution because linear solutions are no longer valid in the nonlinear regime. So we don't have linear solution. We only compare our green solution with finite difference. And it does, uh, as we can see here, the, the error is within like less than 3% in most of the cases. So it, it is, uh, it's kind of comparable. We, we don't know the reason of growth of error. It could be because finite difference uh, is also more diffusive. So it's more of a, comp uh, if we cannot, we do not call it an error. We call it a misfit because it's just a mismatch between grain and finite difference, uh, which could be like because limitations of finite difference or even limitations of our grain model. But overall, it just captures the nonlinear growth in, in, in the system. And then uh, just coming back to uh, the key result that we briefly touched on. So the computational time was the key, was the key uh, outcome of this paper. So as you can see on the left, which I discussed briefly, the wall clock time for uh, grin and finite difference shows that at least uh, grin is 10 times faster than finite difference in 3D for the system that we studied here. So that was a very interesting result. And I hope like people are even, we do more follow-up work in this to see this is a real solution and this is not just case dependent, this could be expanded to other system for other initial condition and for other uh, other <clears throat> system of interest. And the other interesting thing on the right is <clears throat> normalized wall clock time as a function of integration time. So that means like when we're integrating, integrating the time longer, like in system, integrating the system longer in time, we computed the normalized wall clock time for finite difference, which kind of grows linearly, which is makes sense because uh, the total time is dependent on the time step, the number of time step that needs to take. So that goes linearly. But with Grin, it is kind of uh, same with some growth, with some increase in the in, in the later half. So, so we believe that this is also a big advantage if we can do long-term integration with Grin. Of course, there are challenges with pin-space model that we face, like how long can we integrate and how do we know the solution is correct uh, when we do long-term integration. So there are challenges, but at least the initial results uh, do indicate some interesting uh, patterns here that we see that it is at least um, more efficient in terms of, particularly in 3D, is more efficient than finite difference code. In 1D and 2D, I would say like finite difference still wins the race. It's way faster. This is partially because of the overhead cost that comes with uh, training a pins with model. But I'm sure experts in the group, they can have better, we can have better ways of uh, even further reducing the training cost or the overhead cost that comes with training a pin. But to us, this was uh, this was one of the limitations with Green that in 1D and 2D, we are, uh, it's more expensive than finite difference. And then finally, the, just briefly touching up uh, shock front, we don't we don't do any uh, intensive study on that. But this was something we captured even with our vanilla network. We found we found that for uh, some nonlinear perturbation without gravity, there is development of uh, shock fronts, which with finite difference we know that sometimes could be challenging to resolve such shock front. But uh, with our Grin model, we we were able to capture it. Though we had to change the architecture a bit, like we had to increase the uh, the the depth of the layer instead of uh, three we have I think seven uh, number of hidden layers and with that we were able to resolve it but once again not going in the details of it there are papers which addresses specifically capturing shock fronts and uh, how how to uh, resolve such shock fronts so but we just wanted to see that even with our vanilla network we were able to capture it to some extent and compare it with finite difference so ha having said that these are the all the results that we developed in this in this in this paper so just to summarize here uh, we found that our initial motivation was to see if pins can solve systems similar to systems of interest in astrophysics. Yes, with our simplified system, we uh, pins based model did a good job, and particularly in probing like nonlinear growth in perturbation. And then we were ev even able to resolve like high density regions, which happens with growth in density. Of course, we found that in three D pins uh, based model was faster compared to finite difference. So in principle, we can evolve the system much longer, resolve higher density, but that's the future study that we are currently trying to do. And we are looking for people, expertise in pins who can help us like further extend uh, 
such interesting things that we plan to do. But of course, uh, we need more experts in the field because as I said, this is just us exploring mostly. So uh, if we have time later, like I'd like to discuss some of this, like what can we do to do long-term integration while maintaining high resolution? I think this is one of the issues we faced. Like when we want to integrate longer, sometimes we don't know whether the solution is correct. Uh, so that's one issue with uh, with uh, with pins based network, and uh, it is fast as we sh showed in three D. But is it like something universal, or is it like very much the problem that we solved? So that is something also we want to further uh, explore. And can we tra like track gr growing nonlinearity with time evolution? That is something we also want to explore. And of course, when we introduce magnetic field, how do we deal with a divergence of B? Like something which is kind of complicated in uh, astrophysical simulations. We have to have various schemes to see that, okay, we maintain divergence of B. So things like this, can we implement hard constraint? How good are these? So these are things that I want to discuss, if not today, even offline with some of you. And then finally, just to end this slide, I just want to show what we are planning to do with uh, pins. So in NASA, we are interested in like various models for understanding, let's say solar system evolution. So we felt like PINS is one model which kind of do both forward and uh, inverse modeling. So this was a motivation that we want to understand the evolution of solar system over billions of years and for different missions that NASA kind of um, have, uh, capturing different things, different length scales for which some of which we have good physical laws, but we don't have enough data. And for some which we have good data, but we don't have physical laws. So this is something like just a out of the box thinking here, just thinking out loud, can we include pins to model such system where we can complement each other, like missing data with more physical models, physical model with missing data. Like if we don't have physical model, but we have data and vice versa. So I think pins, pin in principle, pins could be powerful in modeling such systems. And uh, yeah, so with that, thank you for your patience and I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It's a wonderful talk. Thank you. Hey, George, I saw you put something in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's uh, regarding the long time integration. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to do this in uh, blocks. So basically what you do, you you continue. So there's uh, this paper that has uh, uh, three different strategies on how to, to do long time integration uh, without losing accuracy. So and and not do it efficiently. So so that's a recent paper. Okay. Thank you. Let me check this out. Okay. Uh, in terms of the divergence, I think that if you just use uh, a constraint with um, the augmented Lagrangian method in the loss. Then, uh, then it's fine. This will work fine. The the divergence of the magnetic field. Okay. So can you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah. So it's it's, it's a method called augmented augmented Lagrangian method. It's okay. like a, mm -hmm. a more accurate than the penalty methods, and you don't need to bring the penalty parameter to infinity for the very large to converge. So, so it's um, yeah. Okay. And like, uh, if we even have like larger systems, like um, I think we need to incorporate some kind of domain decomposition. Is that something? Yeah. So we have. Yeah, that's right. So we have um, uh, papers like um, uh, we, for conservation laws. There's a paper called C pin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which basically does domain decomposition with uh, and and um, at the interfaces. It, it it looks like a discontinuous galeric method, but uh, for pins. So okay. you have domain decomposition, and so it's uh, the first author is uh, Ameya jacked up. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I think I've seen that paper. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Ameya, are you here? Maybe not today. Yes, sure. Yes. Okay. So do you want to put the uh, your paper on the? Uh, yes, the, I'll, I'll uh, put it. The C pin on the uh, screen on the uh, chat, sorry, yes. for uh, the because, I'll do, I'll do. yeah, so so the C pin will work really well for these problems, okay, um, because it's for conservation laws, mm -hmm. uh, and then in combination, Amega is co author in both papers, but I and also in this uh, long time integration, okay, and so another the, thing, uh, for long time, uh, let, me, let me sorry, just uh, 
I mean, let me just complete this uh, the about the divergence. What I told you, there's another paper with another acronym, H-PINs H by Lulu. Okay. H-PINs, how to impose hard, hard constraints or pins. And they propose the uh, augmented Langragian method. So, okay. Zogren, can you find that paper, H-PINs from Lulu? Yes, yes, I'll find it. Yeah, uh, I'll put it here in the chat. Okay. HP. Yeah. Should I think uh, the the simple net simple net paper is also about uh, forcing hard constraints, right? With augmented Lagrange method. Which one? The simple net. Simpnet. Simpnet. Uh... No, for open control. The simple net for open control. Yes, I don't remember. Jen, you have Jen can tell you. He has the augmented Lagrangian there. Yeah, we have you we use the augmented Lagrangian to enforce the inequality constraint uh, in our symbols in that paper. Maybe then we uh, I, I will send the, the link in the chat also. Okay, thanks. Jen. Maybe more questions for the, for the speaker? Uh, I have a question. This is Panos Tinis from Pacific Northwest National Lab. Uh, I, I don't understand how you can go up in dimensions and the wall clock time not grow faster. In the sense that if I go from one to two to three dimensions, mm -hmm. problems that have small scale features, I will need a lot more collocation points. Two. So, so I don't probably in the examples that you have looked at, there is something, some simplifying feature that allows you to go up in spatial dimensions without having to use a lot more collocation points. Yes, I I, I agree with you since uh, as I mentioned for the initial conditions that we chose, this could partially be uh, dependent on that. Uh, but you are right. If we have more small scale features and if we're doing 3D, then the number of co-location points will, of course, change change this result that we are talking about. That's why I mentioned like this is true for the system of interest that we studied and further exploration is needed to quantify, yes, this is uh, how this works with more complicated systems, especially, right. as you mentioned, if we have small, more small scale features like local collapses, and then how do we uh, how do we track that with collocation points here? Yeah? yeah, and if you look, I know you didn't do that for the the first video that mm -hmm. you that you showed us, where you have these very localized features, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the, the, what are the planets that form there, or stars? So the, the stars, yeah, yeah stars. Yeah. Yes. So for those, you will mm -hmm. have to have a lot of collocation points around them to be able to capture this formation. So yes, yes. Yeah. But yeah. but very inter interesting interesting results, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hey Sam, then this is Raj from Brown. So I just had a question. Like most of the problem you showed, you had a periodic boundary condition. So how mm -hmm. did you impose it in the pin framework? Yeah. So that was like uh, just uh, let me go back to the equations. So basically what we did is, let me see. So we calculated the density in the edge of our domain. Like for example, I had co-location points at, uh, for the cube that I'm concerned, I had co-location point at X, in, X out and X in, similarly for Y and Z. And then we calculated the, uh, or we imposed the, we, we just said that whatever the density is on the X end is, like whatever the density is on one end is also similar to the other end. So that's the periodic boundary condition. So they are just similar. Uh, but for that, your function needs to be periodic. So we had sinusoidal or cosine uh, initial conditions. So that kind of helped. But uh, if those were non-periodic, then this is a bit different way of implementing that. Yeah. Hope this is clear. So in that case, your, your grid, should, grid should be uniform. Like when you impose like first point to be second last point and second last point to be first. E, e, sorry, can you elaborate that? So, so you mentioned that the way we impose the periodic boundary condition FD method, like the first the solution is 
equal to the second last solution of the grid. So in that case, you need to have a like uniform grid on those boundaries. So this is yeah. not for the FD. I'm talking about the pins, okay? Like uh... yeah, exactly. So that's that's why I was asking that. How did you impose that on the pins? Yeah. So in the pins. So we have collocation points in both edges, right? Like we we explicitly had collocation point on both ends, and we just set whatever the density at one end is, like let's say uh, on the right end is equal to the density on the left end for the x-axis. Like that's how we set the periodic boundary condition. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Do we have any other questions, comments from the audience? Okay, if not, uh, we'll close this session and we'll go to the next talk. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our second speaker is Zhi Wei Gao, who is currently pursuing his master's degree in Southeast University, China. His research interests include Bayesian inverse problems and image learning and ensemble communication. So, hi, Joe. No, I, I, I can't hear you. You're muted. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, you can start the presentation. Okay, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, uh, I'm very glad here to give a talk about two of my previous work about uh, physics informed neural networks. And uh, I have collaborated with my professor uh, Yan Liang from Southeast University and uh, Professor Zhou Tao from Chinese Academy of Science uh, from uh, to uh, produce this work. So I will divide this talk into four parts. Uh, in the first part, I will introduce some basic knowledge about the physics informed neural networks. And in the second and the third parts, I will introduce our uh, improved failure-informed pins and uh, nearly failure-informed pins. In the next part, I will use two numeric methods to numeric, numeric experiments to verify the effectiveness of our pro proposed frameworks. So we all know that deep learning methods are powerful tools for solving many different problems. Basically, they compose four key, co uh, key components. Uh, firstly, we have some flexible representation of the neural network architectures, or for example, the DNN, uh, the faithful word neural uh, architectures, and also the CN, RN, LSTM, et cetera. So we use this architecture to represent the high dimensional functions in the functional spaces. Afterwards, we need a large data set, uh, for example, the image net, uh, which have 15 million images and uh, 22 classes, to train this neural network to optimize the loss function. Afterwards, we need some efficient optimization algorithms, such as stochastic gradient descent, uh, ADM, to optimize the parameters of the neural networks. Uh, at the next, we need to implement this algorithm using some software, uh, such as PyTorch, TensorFlow, in some different platforms, such as GPU, TPU. So deep learning methods can also be used for solving PDEs. Uh, basically, a PDE consists of two operators, uh, the F operator, the partial differential operator, uh, which is linear or nonlinear, and the B is the binary operator. So the advantages of using deep learning methods for solving PDs can be twofold. Firstly, we can cope with the curse of dimensionality. Well, this is uh, due to the intrinsic nature of the neural networks. Well, secondly, we can query the prediction of the solution at any at any point in the physics domain uh, once the model is trained. So we can achieve the match-free inference. And these are the two advantages of using deep learning methods, basically. Well, there are some uh, related works in recent years to using deep learning methods for solving PDEs, including the deep raise method, uh, the deep galaxy method, and also our focus, the physically informed neural networks. So the general idea of pins is very simple. Uh, we just need to use a very simple DN a faithful word in your network to paralyze the solution in the PDE uh, with parameters theta. So this, are the, this is the general framework of the pins. Uh, firstly, we have some inputs x1, x2, 
And then uh, we have some hidden layers, and then we have some predictions about the solution U. Based on this prediction, we can construct a loss function, uh, which consists of two parts, the PDE loss and the boundary loss. Well, basically the PDE loss is uh, obtained by uh, the L2 norm of the residue function. Well, this residue function is obtained by incorporating the PDE prediction uh, solution, PDE solution prediction UX theta into the equation. And uh, then we can calculate the L2 norm uh, with respect to the prior distribution omega x. Well, the following task is to discrete the loss function. So uh, we have transformed the original problem into an optimization problem by minimizing the loss function of G theta. So the next task is to discrete the loss function by using some samples from the physics domain omega and its partial uh, boundary partial omega. Uh, generally, we will generate some uniform distributed samples from omega and the partial omega to discrete these loss functional uh, by using the Monte Carlo operation motion. Uh, so we denote them as the co-location data set DC and the boundary data set DB uh, respectively. So uh, by using the Monte Carlo operation motion, we can discrete the loss function and then we can optimize the parameters in the neural network to get the optimal parameters. So the advantages of using pins uh, can be diversified. Uh, we can use some uh, automatic differential tools to approximate the derivatives of the solution in the PDE. And also we can just use a simple DN to solve a large class of different uh, problems. And also we can achieve the match free inference once the model has been trained. But uh, pins also will have some limitations. For example, Pins will have difficulty in converging to the true solution uh, in the cases including uh, high dimensional systems and also for problems with low regularities for solution with stiff mutations and also for unbounded systems. Well, in such cases, the uniform sampling strategy will possibly in effective, be ineffective to capture the, uh, the features of the solution. So we will need a more effective and uh, representative sampling strategy to uh, improve the performance in such cases. So this possible failure modes arise from the complicated landscape of the, of the loss function and also the imbalance of different loss terms and also the curse of dimensionality. Well, many methods have been proposed to address, uh, to alleviate this uh, problem. Uh, maybe this they can be divided into uh, three categories, basically. Firstly, the DNA architecture can be modified. Uh, for example, we can train we, we can train ways for every single collocation data point uh, so that the model can pay more attention to the area where the collocation data point has a larger weights. And uh, the second one focuses on the learning scape. For example, the sequence to sequence learning can divide the whole physics domain into a sequence of subdomains along the time direction. While this is similar to the traditional numerical methods uh, such as forward ruler method. Uh, well, our focus is the adaptive sampling strategy. Well, the most representative ones are the residue-based refinement method, the RIA method, and uh, the deep adaptive sampling method. Well, the RIA method focuses on uh, choosing an indicator function, uh, basically the residue function to indicate where the uh, model should pay more attention to the uh, in the physics domain omega. And then the deep adaptive sampling method just a train a normalizing flow uh, based on the residue function. And then we'll generate the samples from this uh, normalizing flow. Uh, and then we'll retrain the neural network to improve the performance. So our work will focus on the adaptive assembly strategies. We want to propose a mathematical framework that can include various assembly strategies. And also we want to uh, propose a more efficient adaptive assembly strategies instead of the uniform assembly strategy. So our idea is very simple. Uh, we just uh, needed to define a limited state functional GX, uh, which consists of two parts. The first part is the performance function QX, and the second part is the tolerance epsilon R. Well, this idea arises from the reliability analysis. So this performance function QX uh, just maps the parameter to a quantity of interest and uh, characterizes the performance of the system. And the tolerance for the performance function will define whether or not uh, we need to uh, attribute this point to the failure set or the safe set. So we can 
based on we can base this uh failure hypersurface gx equals zero to divide the whole physics domain omega into two subsets. The first set is the sub uh, is the safe set, which means that the gx is smaller than zero. And the second set is the filler set, which means that the gx is larger than zero and the performance function qx is larger than epsilon p. So in this safe set, we do not to pay more attention to because in this set, the performance of the pins is already very good. We do not to uh, retrain the neural network over this feeder over this region. And we just need to focus on the feeder region. That is the area where that we need to improve the performance of the traditional pins. So we can define a, a post real indicator, the feeder probability over omega, uh, which is the integral of the prior distribution omega x uh, with respect to the uh, uh, feeder region omega f. So uh, with this indicator, if this indicator is smaller than a epsilon p, a predefined tolerance, we say the whole performance of this system is very reliable and we can stop. Uh, we do not need to improve the performance at all. But uh, if this indicator PF is larger than epsilon p, we say this system is failed and we need to apply some sampling strategies to add more collocation data points in the feeder region and then retrain the neural network to improve the performance over the failure region. So uh, the next challenge is how to estimate this uh, failure probability PF. We say this is an uh, integral. Uh, well, in our work, we just uh, choose the performance function as the absolute value of the residue function Rx theta. And then we can calculate the failure probability, uh, we can calculate the failure region omega f as the area where the absolute value of the residue function is larger than one uh, tolerance epsilon, P, epsilon r. So if the calculated uh, PF is larger than epsilon p, uh, we need to apply some adaptive sampling strategies in the filter region uh, to generate samples from the filter region and add them to the original data set and then retrain the neural network. So this is the general framework of our FIPs. Uh, firstly, we have some inputs x1, x2, and then we have some predictions u. So based on this prediction, we can define the limited state function gx, and we can calculate the failure probability pf. So if the pf is smaller than epsilon p, or predefined tolerance, uh, we can uh, stop the training and say that this system is very reliable. Otherwise, we need to generate uh, adaptive samples from this failure region omega f, and then we will add the adaptive samples to the original data set DC. So and we can retrain the neural network to improve the performance over the field region omega f. Uh, hi, um, my name is Juan. I work with Professor George. I have a question here. Uh, first, uh, you said that this omega that multiplies your dx is, uh, you call it like the uh, prior distribution for the error, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is uh, the prior distribution. Yeah, one question, one of the first questions is like, um, how did you get it? That's the first part. And also, I, I see that you you do this resampling and retraining. How often do you do this? How often do you compute this uh, PF? Like uh, how how many iterations? After how many uh, yeah, iterations yeah, do you yeah, resample? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. I understand, yeah. For this prior distribution, we just set it to be the uniform distribution uh, for a bounded domain or uh, a normal distribution for unbounded domains because our method can also be generalized to unbounded domains. So basically we will choose this prior distribution to be the uniform distribution uh, when the physical domain omega is bounded. And uh, for the unbounded system, we will choose this omega to the truncated Gaussian or normal distributions. And uh, as for the iterations uh, in the PF, uh, we say that uh, the, we just uh, need a very small number of iterations uh, for the convergence of this algorithm. And we will verify the convergence uh, in the later experiments. So we do not need to calculate too many times of the failure probability PF and uh, the computational cost can be neglected. Can be neglected. Well, so in essentially you don't do it at every training step, right? You do it after like 1000 training steps or something like that, right? That's yeah, right. yeah, we just uh, calculated the failure probability, uh, maybe for certain approaches, uh, 1,000, uh, 2,000, et cetera, yeah. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Okay, okay. So uh, as we see that the next challenge now is to estimate the failure probability PF. So the most common way now is to use the Monte Carlo approach motion. 
And uh, the basic idea is very simple. Uh, we just need to generate a large amount of data points from the prior distribution omega x. And then we can use the Monte Carlo operation motion to estimate this feeder probability PF. So if PF is smaller than epsilon P, we say uh, the system is reliable. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, we need to add the new points, the adaptive points from the feeder region uh, to the original data set DC. <laughs> Uh, so these are the procedures, and it is very simple. So uh, you, if we fix the number of adaptive samples uh, added to the original data set DC, uh, our method returns to the RL method. So this is uh, this is a very general thing. And uh, the advantage, the disadvantage of using Monte Carlo operation motion is that for high dimensional spaces, uh, we need a large, a very large data point a very large set of data points, uh, maybe about this order to approximate. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> to approximate this feeder probability PF. So uh, this can be computational cost and uh, we need to devise another way to estimate this feeder probability with high accuracy. So another way to estimate uh, the feeder probability PF with high accuracy is to use the importance sampling. Uh, the only difference here is that we just need to introduce the proposal distribution HX. And then we can write the integral uh, as this way. This is the uh, expectation with respect to the prior uh, to the proposal distribution H HX. Uh, so the only difference in the procedures is that we just need to generate some samples from the proposal distribution HX. And then we can calculate this expectation. Uh, to estimate this uh, failure probability PF with high accuracy. So even though in high dimensional spaces, we can we do not need so many samples to estimate PF with high accuracy. But the problem here is that the optimal importance density H opt is given by this equation. So as we can see that if we want to get the optimal importance density, we need to know the failure probability PF in advance. Well, this is not practical. So the following task is now to find uh, an approximate motion HK, uh, HX hat to approximate the optimal uh, importance density H opt X. Uh, we also note that the deep adaptive sampling method, the DAS method, also wants to find an optimal, find an approximate motion of the optimal importance density. So uh, this method can be attributed to our framework. Well, our idea is very simple. Uh, we just uh, need to find a sequence of middle distributions at Kx to approximate the final uh, optimal uh, density at opt x. And we just assume that these middle uh, distributions at Kx are truncated Gaussian restricted to the physics domain omega. And we just need to uh, estimate these two uh, values, the mean vector and uh, the sigma covariance. Uh, but before that, we need to define a sequence of uh, intermediate feeder regions. For example, the current of intermediate feeder region omega HK uh, is generated by the following procedures. Uh, firstly, we will generate some samples from the current proposal distribution HKX. And then we will choose the samples with the largest uh, LSF values to construct the current uh, to construct the current feeder region omega HK. So we can see that the mean vector and the covariance matrix are just the samples mean and the samples covariance matrix uh, generated by the samples falling into the current feeder region omega HK. So this procedure is very simple. And uh, even though in high dimensional spaces, we can calculate this uh, proposal distribution with fast speed. And we do not need to pay uh, too much attention to this kind of computation. And this is the whole procedure of our self-adaptive assembling procedure. Uh, the problem now is how to determine uh, how to stop the procedure. So we will define uh, we will define an indicator eta. Well, this eta means the number means the number of samples falling into the true feeder region in each in each iteration uh, means the true true number of feeder samples in the true feeder region in every iteration. So if this eta is larger than one expected value, we can stop the procedure and say that the feeder intermediate feeder region is close to the true feeder region. And then we can output the current proposal distribution HKX to replace the original H opt X. 
So our FI pins using the uh, our framework SIAS is very simple. We just need to generate some samples from the approximate uh, HKX, and uh, then other procedures are are the same. So uh, we can also verify the convergence of this FI pins framework uh, under some mild conditions. Suppose the current uh, tolerance epsilon r and epsilon p uh, are given, and then we can obtain that the uh, following error estimate between the prediction ux and the prediction ux theta and the true solution ux can be constrained by these two tolerance epsilon p and epsilon r, and they have their respective convergence orders, and we will verify this convergence order in the following uh, numeric experiments. Uh, so in this part, I have introduced our framework FI pins. Well, FI pins can possibly address many different kinds of problems and by using the failure-informed uh, GX and uh, QX. But uh, there are also some limitations for the FI pins framework. For example, uh, we need to store for certain approaches uh, to calculate the failure probability and uh, then to determine whether or not we need to continue the training. So this may be a little time consuming because uh, we need to stop many times possibly. And uh, the second problem is that uh, for, for, for the residue function with uh, many modes, with many modes, we just use a simple Gaussian uh, pressure motions algorithm. Uh, it is not capable of carrying all of the modes in the uh, residue function. So we must use some new adaptive sampling strategies, uh, such as MCMC based sampling strategies to cover all of the modes in the residue function to improve the performance. So uh, here we proposed uh, a new FI pins framework. Uh, the difference lies in two uh, ways. Firstly, we modify the training scape, and then we choose another sampling strategies to improve the performance compared to the traditional uh, pins and our FI pins. So the procedures are similar. Well, for the training scape, uh, we can see that- Sorry, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Could you go back to the previous slide and then the one before this, where okay, you okay. show the, where you show the theorem? Theory, the okay, yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, here, so here the, the theta star is the uh, minimizer, right, of the neural network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have minimized the parameters in the yeah, yeah. So, so for the for the inequality here, uh, the left hand side of the inequality depends on, uh, this theta star, and the right hand side also depends on theta star. Right, uh, because yes, M, yes, M yes. depends on. So, but but you 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 don't really know theta theta star, right? Yeah, yeah, we, we really don't know the theta star. We just assume that uh, this this value m is bounded. Yeah. Is Then what is the meaning of this inequality? So when we do error analysis, uh, the right hand side is often, like the upper bound is often free of uh, the theta star. So now th this term depends on the value of theta star. So no, you. This is uh, Zogren. This is error. Error is bounded by the residual. I think uh, Handy also has derived similar error bounds like that. Oh, okay, so the, okay. The error, do, the, yeah, the error, the error is bounded by the discrete residual, and they take the maximum value of that and over the. So it, it's, oh, uh, oh, it's fine. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though yeah. this theta star in the residue function, we just assume that this residue function is bounded. So maybe this is independent of the theta star. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Please continue. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, talking about the training scape in the annealing FI pins. So uh, this is different from the training scape in the FI pins. Because here we just choose an indicator function to determine uh, how to stop the training to calculate the failure probability. So in the FI pins, we just stop after after a certain approaches, maybe 1,000 approaches to calculate the failure probability PF. But here we just assume that 
if the training loss or the test loss does not decrease for certain approaches, we will stop the training and then we will calculate the failure probability. Because at this time, we think that we will think that the uh, training is stable, so we can stop and uh, calculate the failure probability instead of just uh, stop uh, after a certain approaches. Uh, this can be a little computational costly. And uh, so if we need to refine the collocation data set DC after we calculating the failure probability PF, uh, we say that the new collocation data set consists of three parts. Well, the first part, the DC coming comes from the original data set DC, and the second part, the adaptive, comes from the samples generated from the adaptive sampling strategy in the failure region omega f. So the next part is the prior prior data set coming from the prior distribution. So we we need to determine the proportion of these three parts now, but uh, we observe that uh, here we sum these three parts to be one, so we can keep the size of the collocation data set DC invariant instead of the growing size uh, to reduce the computational computational cost of DC, and gradually we can move the samples from the prior distribution to the samples in the feeder region omega f. So we can improve the performance DC with the new DC. Uh, but now the problem is how to calculate the proportion eta. And we just calculated eta according to a cosine and annealing strategy uh, about this equation. So suppose our uh, maximum training approach is T max. Uh, if we do not stop during the training, we say this curve looks like this. So this curve looks like this and it will gradually decrease. And then we can calculate the proportion eta if we, if the training loss does not decrease for certain approaches in this point, we can calculate the proportion eta at this point. So we can determine the proportion of these three parts in the new collocation data set DC. And then if we restart at this point, the new curve of the proportion eta will look like this. And then if we restart at this point, the curve will look like this. So basically as the training uh, continues, we can uh, calculate many times of the uh, failure probability, but uh, this time, this number of times is far fewer from, from the times in the failure FIPs framework. Yeah. So uh, this is the training scheme that we have modified to improve the performance of the FIPs. Well, for the sampling strategy, now here we apply the subset simulation from the reliability analysis. Uh, the idea is very simple. Uh, we just uh, divide the feeder region omega f into a sequence of intermediate uh, larger uh, feeder uh, regions omega uh, fm. And then we can decompose the feeder probability pf into a sequence of conditional probabilities as this way. So for convenience, if we can assume that these conditional probabilities to be a constant value, uh, p, we say it p, and then we just need to estimate this final uh, conditional uh, probability. And then we can estimate the failure probability PF. So the goal is very simple. To achieve this goal, we need to define a special, uh, a sequence of special intermediate failure region. Suppose we have uh, many samples. Uh, we have a samples set H SK, uh, which have NS samples. And then we will define the current uh, intermediate failure probability region, uh, omega fk, as this way. We will choose the first NP samples to construct the current uh, uh, failure region, omega fk. So we can assume, we can make sure that this conditional uh, probability to be a constant value p, because we said the NP to be p plus, uh, to be p minus uh, p times ns. And the P is the intermediate probability here we use. And this is the updated rule in the subset simulation. Firstly, we will have NS samples from the prior distribution omega X. And then we will gradually using, we will gradually use the Monte Carlo transition kernel to uh, transform these prior uh, choosing samples uh, to the true failure region omega FK, omega F. But uh, before that, we need to define a sequence of intermediate feeder regions. Uh, so we can see that uh, these prior samples will be firstly transformed to the uh, first uh, intermediate feeder region and then gradually to the another feeder regions. And finally, this true feeder region lies here. So 
uh, these symbols will uh, will gradually be transformed to the true uh, field region here. And then we need a stop criterion here. Uh, at each iteration, we need to calculate the true number of failure samples. That is the number of samples falling into the true failure region at each sample uh, among these NS samples. So we can calculate this value NFK to determine whether or not we need to stop the, uh, the iteration. Well, if this number NFK is larger than one expected value, we say the intermediate failure region omega FK is close to the true failure region omega F. And then we can we can stop the iteration and output the uh, failure probability, and then we can output the adaptive samples. So the idea is very simple. And this is our uh, core framework and nearly FI pins. Now we just need to use two numeric experiments to verify the effectiveness of our two improved. Uh, Frameworks. Firstly, I will use this one peak problem, which is a Poisson equation with one peak looks like this. So uh, this problem will have one peak looks like this, and uh, will have, and it has low regularities. And we will compare the samples from uh, different sampling strategies, including the uniform sampling strategy and uh, the RIR sampling strategy, and our new uh, SAI sampling strategy. We can see that our Samples generated by using the SAI sampling strategy will concentrate on the peak. Will also will concentrate on the peak. So it will basically improve the performance uh, where the residue error is large. Well, this uh, is the numeric results obtained by using different sampling strategies. The next row represents our uh, results. We can see that the results obtained by using our adaptive 70, adaptive sampling strategy is a little better, is much better than the other ones. And uh, we also calculated the L2 error uh, among the updates. So during the updates, we can see that this blue line, this blue line represents the L2 error obtained by using our SAIS method. And this red line represents the error obtained by using the uniform sampling strategy. And this uh, this green line represents the error obtained by using the RER sampling strategy. So during the updates, we can see uh, our method obtains the smallest relative error compared to other baselines. And we also plot the failure probability in this, in this red line to indicate that during the updates, our model becomes more reliable as the indicator failure probability gradually decreases. I have a question. Can you... Make okay, that okay. plot versus cost. Somehow, if you can put the cost there. Uh, the cost. Okay. Um, yeah, well, so, I do so... not demonstrate. Uh, I do I do not demonstrate the cost. But in our paper, we have demonstrated cost. In this, uh, here, uh, because the time consuming, uh, I do not demonstrate the cost. But, but is uh, it, is we can show that the time cost. Yeah. Yeah. Is it is the cost? of SAIS is less than RAR? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, SAIS cost uh, uh, is a little smaller than RAR because we just uh, choose um, the number of samples is similar to SA to RAR. Yeah, we just set the, the number of choosing samples to be the same among these three different assembly strategies to make uh, okay. to ensure equality, yeah. Okay. But, but you do have this overhead also of computing the uh, the metrics to do the uh, requirement. So, so how the, you say that that doesn't cost you anything? Uh, uh, can you repeat that? You have the cost to compute the probabilities. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, this is the true. This is the failure probability in our framework. We just set this. Uh, well, this we just set this intermediate failure probability to be a constant value p not the failure not the final failure probability pf in, we just set this intermediate failure probability pf uh, to be a constant value in order to calculate the final uh, failure probability pf because we just need to uh, estimate this conditional probability p omega f omega f m and then we can set these this these conditional probabilities to be the constant value and then we can 
uh, just estimate this one, this value, and then we can calculate the failure probability. This is the principle. Not We do not set the failure probability to be a constant value. OK, so let's go on. So uh, in this figure, we verify the convergence uh, of our framework. And uh, in the left figure, we uh, we just set the tolerance epsilon r to be a constant value 0 0.1. And then we gradually increase the value of epsilon p. Uh, we can observe an approximate order, convergence order of 0 0.5. Uh, so we have. Uh, repeat the experiments with turn times and uh, compute the mean value of this error. Well, in the right figure, we also uh, fixed the epsilon p to 0 0.1, and then we gradually increased the uh, uh, value of epsilon r, and we can observe an approximate uh, convergence order of 1. So these results are uh, consistent with our former analysis. Uh, we can turn to the former pages. So they, we say that uh, this epsilon r has convergence order one, and the, this epsilon b has convergence uh, order uh, 0 0.5. <clears throat> so uh, here I use another example to verify the effectiveness of our annealy FI pins. Uh, here we just choose the equation to be look like to look like this, and the, the analytic solution uh, will have several peaks. So we just uh, choose the analytic solution uh, which have four peaks look like this, uh, which have uh, low regularities. And here we choose different performance functions. Uh, the R F I P. Uh, here we choose the residue function as the re uh, as the performance function, and the G F I P we choose the gradient of the residue function as the performance function. So during the updates, we can observe that uh, the failure probability gradually decreases uh, for both methods, indicating that the model the model has become more reliable during the updates. Also, to verify that our method can have better performance, uh, even though when the number of the samples is very small, even though when the number of the co-location data points is very small, we can uh, we can still achieve uh, comparatively better performance uh, compared to other baselines. Well, this red line represents the Vena pin. Uh, so uh, as the number of the co-location data set grows, and this blue line, this green line represents the method uh, of FI pins by using the RL assembly strategy. And the, this orange and the blue line represents the method of using the residue function and the gradient of the residue function as the performance function, and then our adaptive sampling strategy. So we can observe that even though, even though the number of the co-location data set is very small, about 500 samples, we can still achieve a comparatively much smaller uh, prediction error compared to other baselines. Uh, this is the numerical results achieved by different methods. So uh, we can see that for these four peak keys, uh, our method, the RFI ping and the GFI ping, uh, will have comparatively better co uh, performance compared to the uh, MCFI ping uh, by using the RR assembly strategy when the number of the co location data set is 2000. Well, here we also need to notice that to ensure equality, we will assume uh, the number of DFT samples for uh, every method is equal. So uh, this is the final samples distribution for different uh, methods. Uh, we can see that by using our assembly strategy, uh, even though for different performance functions, the residue function and the, the gradient uh, uh, of the residue function. We can also use other assembly, uh, other performance functions. The samples will concentrate on these four peaks. We'll concentrate on these four peaks. So uh, the performance of our framework will be comparatively better. 
Uh, here we also plot the relative error during the training approaches. And uh, this figure represents the FI, uh, the MCFI pin. This orange line, this orange line represents the relative error obtained by using the uh, MCFI pin. And this purple line represents the error obtained by the Vena pin. So we can observe that by using the MCFI pin, the re relative error gradually decreases. And uh, in the middle and the right figure, we just use different uh, methods. Uh, that is the RFI pin and the GFI pin. So this uh, purple line represents the relative error obtained by using the relative the, the Vena pin. And this uh, orange line represents the error obtained by using the, uh, the our sampling strategy. And this uh, orange line represents the relative error obtained by using our sampling strategy. We can observe that the relative error obtained by using our M, uh, RFI pin and the GFI pin decreases a little faster than the MCFI pin. Uh, well, these are the two co uh, co reference for this talk. So in the future work, uh, I'm, consider I'm considering now uh, whether I can uh, employ this framework in the uh, operator learning scapes, uh, for example, the depot net uh, scapes, because this is similar. So uh, maybe I can generalize this framework to the depot net for, uh, training scape. And also I want to use pins or depot net to, uh, to run some parallel uh, algorithms for some time consuming models, such as time dependent models. And uh, I'm now working on this work. Uh, I want to employ the pins in the uh, parallel assembly strategy, parallel computing algorithms, and uh, for time for some uh, time dependent systems. And also, I want to uh, generalize this framework into the deep operator learning scapes. So um, basically, the deep net uh, is very simple to implement. So basically, I can I can generalize this framework to the deep net. So this is the end of the talk. Uh, thanks for your listening. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy, for your, for your talk. And thank you for staying up late uh, with us. Okay. Do you have any questions and comments from the audience? George, do you want to comment anything? No, maybe maybe Chen Shi is worked on this with Lulu. Maybe Chen Shi got uh, have a yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Right. Did you write the paper, Chanshi? What did you can you, can you yeah. uh, introduce yourself and say what you did with Lulu? Yeah, I I actually just checked your guys' paper and I said I think our paper is in your citation number twenty four. And uh, in your paper you introduced us as a literature review, but we actually also introduced some of uh adaptive method too. Uh, implement the pin sample. Can you put your paper on the chat? Yeah, sure. So this was uh, Chenshi. Describe what you did. You was a a improvement of RAR, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, we just need to uh, improve the performance compared to RAR. Yeah. Because we think that for high dimensional. No, I mean, I mean, Chen Shi, the, the person who is talking, she's, she wrote the paper with Lulu. Before yeah, you. I have read the paper, yeah. Oh, you have read the paper? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I have read the paper, oh, yeah. Yeah, our paper is one of his citation, but uh, we do more than a literature review. We also introduce some uh, adaptive method. Uh, Oh, so it's a literature review, it's not a new method? No, uh, so our paper it introduced two new methods, but he introduced our paper as a literature review in his paper. Oh, <laughs> oh well, <laughs> maybe you can tell, that's why I gave you the floor, so you can um, tell him what, what you did. Uh, and, yeah, and we actually... Yeah, we first uh, do a comparison of current method, like the uniform sampling and the RER method. 
but we also based on that on top of that we also introduced two methods one is called RARD and the other is uh, called RAD they are uh, one is sample based on the distribution and one is to add small point based on the error distribution and we have a specific a function to uh, calculate the distribution uh, based on the residual. So they didn't compare with this, right? They didn't compare with your. No. Do we? Uh, there, there. Did you understand Chance's method? It's not. Uh, the, it's yeah, not yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. It's something else. But but you didn't con you didn't compare you compare with RAR, but not with your method, and uh, I should I should have known because I was the one who handled your paper in in the CISC, so I should have asked you to do it. <laughs> but I I did. <laughs> I did yeah yeah I know time. that <laughs> yeah. Uh, so possibly, um, maybe I want to compare the uh, results obtained by using different RR methods because there are uh, some different RR methods now. So uh, I can read the future and uh, I can compare the results. <laughs> uh, may, may I ask another question? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, also re related about the sampling strategies. There's a paper like where they do like uh, it's called investigating molecular transport in the human brain from MRI physics informed neural networks, and they propose something similar to what you do because they said that if they have too many points, um, it makes not no sense to add more points because if you already have many points, it, it's hard for the model to deal with that many. So they do this kind of they call it like resampling method. Which is, I think that's what you were saying because you said that the number of collocation points that you have is is fixed in the end. Um, Juan, Juan, you're talking about seeding, right? Not not the numerical method, right? About seeding the seeding the flow, right? No, I'm I'm talking that uh, that they do this they, in this paper about this called uh, the one I just mentioned. They do the same thing as Lulu, like this refinement R R A R R, but they call it like resampling. Because in I think Lulu's case, and I'm not sure I haven't read Chengshi's paper, but they they add more points where you have high errors. But in this case, they do exactly what uh Jiwei is doing. They just resample. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. But, I read the paper. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, Their strategy but, is very similar. Yeah. Yeah. But the but the one one question that I have there is like, for example, let's let's see that you you go to the third picture that you're showing, the one here. When you no, the the one you the one you where where you where the one before like the one before where you have where you have the. No, I think it's only thirty five. Okay, thirty five. Thirty five, thirty four. Yeah, yeah. yeah this for, one. for example, here if we go to this G F I P I N and uh, okay, that but wouldn't in this case wouldn't be you be like we don't don't you have some kind of risk of overfitting, uh, the data because what if okay I understand everything the error is high is is you resample more points when you have high errors. But what if, as you learn new points, you start to forget the other ones? In this case, you don't have sensors to, to keep track of that, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. This is the case I have considered, yeah. <laughs> so uh, as you can see that there are still uh, a small set of samples uh, lying in other areas, except, except for these four peak uh, areas. So yeah. uh, in these areas, we just need a small set of samples to keep the uh, value to be accurate. Oh, OK, OK. Uh, because so. uh, the, the issue with, uh, I mean, in this case, you have like only four points where you where you want to learn. So I mean, it makes sense because, but what I, because I work also with oh, trying to optimize things and things like that. And sometimes the issue that you have is like, you start forgetting things. So you already learn these things. And if you don't pay attention, you cannot just forgetting them because they can become a problem later. So it's good to keep sensors there. So for example, if you ask me, the one, this R F I P N N, this one looks way better because you have a lot of sensors. So if something gets out of control, you still have the chance to go back. Yeah, yeah, makes. I know. I, yeah, I understand it. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. So um, so this will depends on the problem. <laughs> Yeah, for, for my problem, maybe this is reasonable. But for other problems, maybe this looks like unreasonable. So uh, if we can update a uh, little smaller times, uh, maybe uh, the sample distribution will look like this. 
it will look more reasonable. Yeah. Great. And, and also one thing that may be interesting to see, I mean, uh, is like, for example, seeing with uh, different geometries, for example, uh, resampling in a square is a bit boring because it's just, you just put something in the middle and you're good. But what happens <laughs> if you have like a really messed up geometry? How how you do it in those cases? But uh, this was really great. I really liked your talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just define define such a case uh, for our method, yeah. But uh, for uh, many real problems, we have also verified the effectiveness uh, in, some, uh, in our paper. We have tested the Burgers equation and also some high uh, frequency problems and also some unbounded problems. Uh, our method will basically works well, but here we just uh, use this example to worry, to uh, look more directly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. That's good. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, yeah. Is there any more question, our speaker? Uh, if not, thank you, Joe Wei, for your presentation. And yeah, this is a wonderful work, a wonderful uh, presentation. And okay. uh, we're about to close the session this week. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick announcement. We're not having a seminar next Friday uh, during Thanksgiving. So we'll continue our seminar in December 1st. So see you in two weeks. Bye. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah. Goodbye. <laughs>